Well, once again, I'm glad to have you this morning as uh, Caleb and, and Tara were lighting the Advent candles this morning. Uh, just a reminder to us that we're in the season of Advent. And if Advent is not something that you're used to, it's not part of your spiritual tradition, uh, Advent are the, are the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, where we spend the time lighting candles, reading scripture, considering and pondering the, the events surrounding the birth of Christ, and we, it culminates on Christmas Eve with the Christmas Eve celebration as we uh, usher in the advent or the coming, that word means coming or arrival, of Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And so we're in this season of Advent. If you were here last week or if you streamed online last week, you know that we started with an understanding of the name of Jesus, rediscovering some things about who God is, that the angels said that this, ba- this baby that would be born to Mary would be called Jesus. And they said that not because just because that's what people are going to call him for the rest of his life, but because it was a mission that he was sent to save his people from their sins. He says, you will be named Jesus, which literally means the Lord saves, because he will save his people from their sins. And earlier he says, the angel says that this child that's going to be born will be the son of God, that he would be the incarnated God, the second person of the Trinity, ever existing, uncreated one that was going to take the form of a of a human and was going to be incarnated, or what theologians call the incarnation, the enfleshment of God. And so we talked last week, if you were here, we talked if you know the significance of your name and where it is that you came from, where your name came from, and, and what there might be some means, or we talked a little bit about that with just the people near you, just to kind of spend a moment or two just kind of having some conversations, just with the people that are close to you. This morning, I've got a new question for you that I want you to spend a few minutes just to kind of talk with those people that are around you, or if you're online, we'd love to see you comment in the sections there and let us kind of interact with you as well. And that is, if you have a favorite hymn or a Christmas song, what is that favorite song or favorite Christmas hymn that you know of, uh, and just kind of talk about it, and maybe why it's your favorite Christmas song or why it's your favorite Christmas hymn. So I can give you a couple minutes to go talk about that, just kind of with the people near you. You don't have to get up and move around. Just kind of talk there, and then I'll bring you back. All right? Ready, set, go. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you. All right, if you guys want to come back, turn your attention back up here. Uh, real quickly, just a little survey. Anybody want to shout out some of the favorite hymns that you heard? No wrong answer here, by the way. Silent Night, Silent Night Oh Holy Night. Mary did, you know? Mary, did you know? You know what I should do? Never mind. Keep going. I should make you sing it. Like, say, you know, and, say, and no one's going to say that. I'm not saying anything. I don't want anything. No, they should do it and you should sing No, I'm not singing it. I'm not singing it. No. 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 Listen, I'll tell you what, it sounds really good in my head when it does when it happens. Yeah, no, green sleeves, yeah, great. Uh, other ones. What child is this? Hallelujah. Little drummer boy? A Christmas song? Oh come and come, Emmanuel. Grandma got ran over by a reindeer. Don't, <laughs> don't say it but under your breath. I will hear you and I'll say it out. Yes. Fantastic. Why is that your favorite song? Bonnie, that's a little morbid. Man. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing. It's fun. Yeah. 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 White Christmas. Sharon, I would have expected blue Christmas from you. I, honestly, I would have said. Uh, yeah, un, no, no, you can't take it back. Can't take it back. Can't take it back. Sharon, if you did not know, is probably the biggest Elvis fan I've ever seen in my life. And the fact that you don't say Blue Christmas is a little concerning to me. Oh, goodness. Uh, any other ones? All right. Well, uh, all those are, are fantastic. They're really fun. And, they're, and they sometimes kind of just kind of get you in the mood for Christmas, right? You put the Christmas music on. You have decorations going on. Those kind of things, really fun, kind of a festive part of stuff. And most of the Christmas hymns, at least, not just the Christmas songs, but most of the Christmas hymns focus on the glory of God, 
on the majesty of God, this holiness of the night that Christ was born. And for good reason, because it was a holy night, and it's good for us to be reminded of the majesty, the awesomeness, and the, the wonder of it all. And so we ought to sing about that. We ought to remember those things. A proper vision of who God is, understanding the nature of God, it helps us to live our life well, because what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing to understand. What you think about when you think about God will shape how you live, what you think about other people, how you respond to the culture around you. What you think about when you think about God is perhaps one of the most important things to understand. And so when we sing Christmas hymns, they focus our attention on the glory, on the majesty, on the significance of Jesus and the holiness of that night. And it's good because that kind of reverence, that kind of awe will help us understand how we can, how we can uh, understand what's going on in our culture, how we can respond in a way that's Christ-centered and good. So it's fully appropriate for us to sing of the glory and the majesty of that, how high above, how awesome God is, and it's good for us to have a, an awe or a wonder when we think about God. But what I want us to do in this moment, this morning, is help us to rediscover some new things about the Christmas story that might inspire awe, that might inspire worship, might inspire depth of devotion, but maybe at a different way. I want us to consider the great lengths or the great depths to which Christ has come on his rescue mission. We said last week, remember, that Jesus is named Jesus, meaning the Lord saves, for he will save his people from their sin. That, that Jesus is sent on a rescue mission to save us from the entrapment and our sin and the rebellion and the stuff that's going to lead us apart from God. To, to lead us to a life that's eternal, both now and for the rest of our life. But I want us to consider, at least for a moment here, the great lengths to which God has gone in order to rescue and redeem and save us. That he was born that first Christmas morning, but how far Christ had to go in order to be born, in order to save. For that, I want us to understand what, we're, what might be considered the divine descent of God who leaves his throne on high to be born that first Christmas morning. And what great lengths he has gone to. What great lengths he has gone to for us. For us. And for that, I want to read a hymn, a song that was sung by the early church. Most historians would think about this is perhaps the earliest hymn that we have record of in the early church that was talked about, that was sung as they would gather in gatherings like we're gathered this morning, but maybe in homes or maybe out in public square, they would sing this song. And the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote it down for us in a letter that he's writing to his good friends in the church in Philippi. And he writes it down, he quotes from this hymn, this early Christian hymn. Now it's not necessarily a Christmas hymn, but I think you'll get the picture why it might be as we read about it. It's recorded for us in the book of Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to start in verse 5. Paul, so Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And here's this hymn. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is quoting from this what would have been a familiar hymn to many of the Christians in his day that they were singing. And in this hymn speaks of what we celebrate at Christmas. This hymn, this, this poem, or this song speaks to what we celebrate, the depths to which Christ has come on his rescue mission, the willingness to empty himself, to step out of the throne room of heaven and to come and to be dwelling with us, to come to us in our situation 
in order to fulfill his mission to free us from the bondage of sin and to initiate us into an eternal kind of life, both now and to the rest of eternity, the depths of which God is willing to go. And what you see in this hymn and what you see at Christmas and what we celebrate at Christmas is what we can call the divine descent. The divine descent. And what I want us to rediscover is the magnitude of this divine descent. And may we have a greater awe and worship because of it. May our response to God be impacted when we understand the magnitude and the depth to which God is willing to stoop for us. Many of us are familiar with the nativity scene, right? We see them in stores. We may have them on our mantle. We may have one out in our yard. They're pristine little china dolls. They just kind of look really great. But sometimes the familiarity with the story, in particular the familiarity that we have with the nativity scenes, we know what they look like. We know what they kind of, Sometimes we neglect or we miss just how dramatic it was for the God of the universe to descend to be a child, a vulnerable infant child to take on flesh. And what this passage does is it paints a picture for us what Christ has done for us, willingly taking off the privileges of divinity to be near us, to be in our midst. And it's a portrait of what we are to do and what we are to become. The Apostle Paul says, in your lives with one another, your attitude should be the same of Christ Jesus. So not only is this hymn a, a reflection of what God has done in the divine descent by leaving the throne room of heaven and being enfleshed as a little baby, but it's an example for us for how we are to respond and how we are to live with other people. And so this morning I want to walk through this passage together. And as I walk through it, I want us to feel the descent of God, the, the coming lowness, the, the humility of God. As he comes on that first Christmas morning, as he's born as a baby and laid in a feeding trough. As I walk through each of the lines of this song, I feel the weight of it all. See, the first part of the passage, you see God. Jesus is God. In, in the very nature, God. The majesty of God. The uncreated one. The omnipotent one. The second person of the Trinity who spoke the universe into existence. God being, or Jesus being in very nature, God, he says, makes himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant. Being made in human likeness. And he humbled himself. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross, as low as you can go. Can you feel the descent? Can you feel the coming lowness, the humbleness? With each phrase, another rung down the ladder, from the highest of all majesty to the lowest of shame and scorn, lowest of lows, the lowest you can imagine. The cross was and is perhaps the most horrendous, humiliating, torturous death that Western society has ever come up with. And it was to that lowest of lows that Jesus willingly endured. That Jesus, the God of the universe, the omnipotent one, the uncreated one, willingly took off the privileges of divinity and each step came lower and lower, even on a cross. But in this hymn, in this song, the cross is the turning point. It's the hinge pin. For the next part of the hymn starts with, at the cross, God exalted him and gave him a name above all names, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God, from the lowest of lows back to the highest of majesty. And what you see in this poem, what you see in this hymn, this early Christian song that was sung at gatherings around is what we celebrate at Christmas. God incarnate coming low 
born as a child, willingly enduring the shame and the scorn and the scoffing, willing to do it all on his rescue mission, and all of it brings glory to God in the highest heaven. Just let that sink in for a minute. Before we move on to what it may speak to us, it may say, just let the, the truth of that sink in for a moment. What we celebrate at Christmas is way more than just a nice little nativity scene or just a small human that was born and placed in a feeding trough with some nice little hay and everything else looking really nice. But what we celebrate is the God of the universe out of his immense love for us and all of humanity, lays aside the privileges of heaven and willingly demotes himself to the lowest of lows and experiences the divine descent for us. What does that tell you about the love of God for humanity? What does that tell you about the love of God for you, that he, what great lengths he was willing to go to on this rescue mission. What great lengths the God of the universe was willing to go to for you and I. What we celebrate on Christmas is way more than just a holiday that we can get off of work and have some good meal and food together. We celebrate the divine descent of God coming low in humility. Let that sink in. And what I want us to do is take that understanding of the divine humility, the descent of God into human flesh, and I want us to see that in the Christmas narrative. Where do you see that? We see it at least in three areas, right? You see it in how he came, to whom he came, and the place that he came. Take it one by one. How did he come? We're told in the scriptures that how he came and the birth of Jesus was a rather uneventful event. In fact, there were people in the neighboring houses and the neighboring places that just missed it altogether. Didn't know it. Now, if we were planning the arrival of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God of the universe, if we were planning that celebration, if we were planning, we probably would have planned it differently, right? We, it would not have been a situation that went without fanfare or without a parade or without much to do. We would have been planning this arrival for months, years even, crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's, making sure all the A-list people were invited and here, making sure we have all the food and more food than you can imagine, decorations, all the lights, everything you can imagine. Such a historical event like this. If you and I were planning the arrival of someone like that, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the omnipotent, all-powerful one, well, then we would have planned it differently. I mean, just think about it, right? Think about how we plan Christmas dinner. Think about how we plan Thanksgiving. We just had that. Think about how we plan a special birthday dinner. We get decorations. We, we get dressed up for it. We, we make preparations. We set the table nice. We put the fine china out. We have special placemats. We have special things. We make sure we invite special friends to come over to celebrate with us. We make all this to do for a Christmas dinner or for Thanksgiving. Can you imagine what we would have done if you and I were planning the arrival of the almighty King of Kings? It would have been different. It would have taken on a certain feel, a certain air. We, had a, we would have had candles burning, a little ar- aromatic things happening in there. But you and I, we didn't plan the arrival, did we? God did. And God, the omnipotent creator, uncreated one, the creator of the universe, he came with such simplicity, such quiet, such humility, such little fanfare that, like I said, most people missed it altogether. They missed the significance of it. And so what you see in the fact that though how God came and how his arrival showed up that first Christmas reminds us of the humility of it all. The God coming low. You see this divine descent in how he came. But you also see this descent, this lowliness, this humility, this emptying of himself to whom he came. To whom he came. We're told that he was coming and he was born to this poor, teenage, unwed girl. The God of the universe came as a vulnerable child 
and entrusted himself to an unwed, poor teenage girl. Depending on her for food, for nourishment, teaching him how to walk, changing his diaper, all of it. He willingly placed himself in the caring arms of a poor teenage girl. Think about that. The self-emptying ways of God was willing to be cared for, looked after, and he submitted himself to her. He doesn't come with the typical ways of power, making sure everything is laid out to him and fed to us by a silver spoon. He doesn't come in those ways. So what do you see? The nature of God, this divine descent, this humility, this servanthood. You see that not only in how the birth of Jesus happens, but to whom it comes. But you also see it in that third one, in the place that he comes. The place he comes. He doesn't come to the palace. He doesn't come to the power centers of the world, but he comes to rural Palestine in some small little town of Bethlehem, far away from luxury, far away from notoriety, far away from all the various places where power and decisions were being made, and he's placed in the feeding trough of an animal, of an animal, lowly, humility, coming low. The the depths to which Christ is willing to come on his rescue mission, out of his intense love for you and I, for you and I. See, unlike many of the nativity scenes that we portray on our mantles or, in our fire, or by our fireplace or by our, in our front yards or someplace else, there wasn't anything lovely about this situation. It was dirty. It was messy. It wasn't Pinterest-worthy at all. There were no essential oils burning in the sideline back over there, right, to make the, set the mood all nice. It was lowly, it was dirty, stinky, messy, it was real. And God of the universe came to that place, in that way, to those people. You see, we dress up for Christmas, right? We put Christmas sweaters on, we put put nice, we dress our houses up, we dress up the dining room tables. But what we celebrate at Christmas is the exact opposite of that. God dressed down, taking off the divine privileges and coming low humility and serving, all to liberate us from the the bondages of sin, to lead us to a life in eternal way with him right now. And how he came, to whom he came, and the place he came, you see this lowliness, you see this divine descent willing to go. But why would he do that? Why would the God of the universe choose to come in such lowly, humble, servant kind of way? Why would the God of the universe choose to do it this way? And that's like a million dollar question. We can spend like decades talking about all the reasons why he does and what's the reason of this and that kind of stuff. We don't have the time for that. And I simply don't want to oversimplify it and say, well, let's whittle it down to one or two things. But I am going to suggest one significant reason why the God of the universe would come with such lowliness, with such humility, why he would take off the divine privileges of the high throne room of heaven and come to be born on that first Christmas morning, why he would do that. The one suggestion I want to give us is that he has a desire to be known. God has a desire to be known. You see, if God had come with just a fraction, just a portion of his glory, then you and I would have taken off for the hills running in fear. Whenever an angel of the Lord, not just not God himself, but whenever an angel of the Lord shows up to people, what's the first thing an angel has to say to somebody? Don't be afraid. A messenger of the Lord has such glory and honor and power. The messenger of the Lord has to tell people, don't be afraid. Can you imagine if God of the universe showed up in just a fraction of his glory, a fraction of who he really is, without humility, without coming low, without taking off the divine privileges, without doing that, we would have been running for the hills in fear and fearing for our lives and full terror for all of who we are is laid bare before God. And so one of the reasons, among others, but one of the reasons that God comes the way he comes, the way he undresses off of the divine and comes to be clothed in humanity as a baby is because he doesn't want us to run. He wants us to be be known. He wants us to be with us. 
I mean, think about how you might respond if you saw someone of great influence walk in the room. Maybe someone in your field of expertise, your job or your field or some place that you really admire and some person that you really admire has got great influence, maybe great wealth, maybe great popularity, maybe something else. And they walk in the room and it's this person has achieved the pinnacle of what you want to achieve. Oftentimes we stand at a distance and we don't just run over to them and give them, you know, a fist bump and say what's going on. And kind of we stand at a distance and we, 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 rec- we recognize we're in the presence of glory, right? We do that with people. Do that with people. But what if the God of the universe doesn't want us to stay at a distance? What if the God of the universe doesn't want us to stay arm's length away and afraid and full of terror? What if the God of the universe wants to be approached? What if the God of the universe wants us to come near him? What if the God of the universe wants us to be in relationship with him? What if the God of the universe doesn't want us to be standing at a distance, shaking in our boots in terror and in fear? But what if the God of the universe wants us to be near to him, to approach him? Well, there's not much, thing, not many things that are, are, are more approachable than a baby. Babies don't scare us. At least not most of us. Right? Babies are approachable. What do you see when you see a small baby? These babies that we dedicated this morning, they draw you in, don't they? They draw you in. Perhaps one of the reasons that God stepped out of his divine throne room and willingly took off the divine privileges, did not consider equality something with God to be grasped or held on to, but made himself nothing, taken on the very form of a servant, humbled himself, obedient to death, even death on a cross. Perhaps one of the reasons was he wanted to be approached. Wanted to be approached. I hope that that reminds us that God's disposition towards us is not angry, now with his arms folded, with a scowl on his face, ready to scold and whip us into, into submission. But the disposition of God is one who's willing to take off the divine privileges to be enfleshed among us and to come as a baby so that we would approach him. That we would approach him. We'd be willing to come. God's disposition towards us is wanting an interactive life with him, with he is at the center And that we may experience the abundance of eternal life right now. That is a great expression of love to willingly place yourself out of the highest and out of the majesty to come low, humbly, to be approached. So what does that tell you about the importance of the mission of Christ and his love for you? That he would be willing to endure such divine descent to come for you. A relationship necessitates approachability. You can't have a relationship with someone that you're not willing to approach. You can't have a relationship with someone that you don't feel welcome, that you can walk in. There's no relationship without the ability to approach. And what we see in the Christmas story is God himself, the omnipotent, all-powerful one, willingly descending to the most vulnerable place because he wants to be known and he wants you to know him. He wants me to know him. So what do we take from that? I told you that one of these things in these, in these scriptures that will help us to understand the nature of God but also was about us. How does that inform how we live? A proper vision of God and what we think about God shapes how we respond in our own response. So what do you take away from understanding the divine descent from God? There's at least two things I want to suggest for you that you might take with you from this passage in Philippians and this understanding of Jesus coming from us. The first one is that let's put aside the notion of having to clean up before you come to God. Let's just put aside the notion that you got to clean up before you come to God. This is the way Christ came. The truth of this, the first Christmas, is that we would approach him, that, we are, that he's approachable. And for those that don't have a relationship with God, sometimes the, the mentality is that I, I'll somehow be accepted by God if I clean up my act first. If I stop doing these things, then maybe God will forgive me. And if that's you, if that's your perspective of God, you need to know that the God of the universe, the first Christmas morning 2,000 or so years ago, stepped into humanity, divinely descended down so you don't have to clean yourself up in order to come to him. You don't have to clean yourself up and kind of get your act together before he's willing to welcome you into his family. 
And he'll do the cleaning on his own. But it's also true for those of us who've been following God for some time. We gave our life to Jesus. We gave our, our hearts to Jesus some, maybe some years ago. But we know the right things to say in our prayers, and we try to clean them up. We try to Christianize them. And we don't bring our unedited selves before God in prayer. We, we bring an edited, Christianized version of who we are. And, and so we, we have a prayer, or we have a, an issue, or a, an anxiety, or a fear, or something that's causing some, uh, some anxiety or some uncertainty in our lives. We don't know what to do with it, but we know the right Christian thing to say. Well, we're supposed to trust God in all things or, you know, in all things, prayer by prayer and petition, present my request before God. And I'm just supposed to do these things. And I'm not supposed to be anxious about anything. God, whatever you want to happen. We know the quite Christian things to say, but that's not the real raw part of us. And what we see in the Christmas story, what we begin to rediscover is that God wants to be known. And he's vulnerable with us that we can approach him even in our mess, even in our uncertainty, even in our doubts, even in all of that. We don't have to pretty it up. You can be real and authentic and raw. And God can handle it. So if you're someone who is far from God and you have not yet turned your life over to the lordship, the kingship, and the rule of Christ in your life, could you just know you don't have to clean yourself up before you come to Jesus? You don't have to get your life in order before he's going to welcome you at his table. But if you're someone who's been following Jesus for some time, would you take the risky step of being raw and honest and vulnerable in your prayers? Bring your unedited self. For one of the things we learn about God in the Christmas story is he desires to be known and he's approachable. Approachable. Second takeaway that we can take with us in this deal is that maybe we need to follow the way of Christ in demoting ourselves a little bit and humbly serving, coming lowly. The Apostle Paul, right before he talks and he, reads, or he recites this hymn, he says, in your lives with one another, your attitude, be, attitude should be that that Christ Jesus had. So he's given us a model of how we are to live. See, the Christian life is not only to see God for who he is, but it's to apprentice ourselves after him, to learn to take up his way of being in this life. So as Christ voluntarily came down, took the role of a servant, humbled himself, that others may find life, then we will find meaning and purpose in our life, not by being the most notable in a room, not by being the most you know, well-known or the people that come and gather around us, but by learning to serve, by willingly demoting ourselves and taking the role of a servant and to serve others without a parade, without a fanfare, but quietly, lowly, in order to uplift others. And just as a side note, just as a way to, of encouragement, I've been thoroughly encouraged over these last couple of weeks by you all. You walk out into the lobby over there, and if you're online, I, I wish you could see the presents that are in that lobby for Angel Tree. 168 children have been blessed through the people of Crossroads this year because of generosity, of sacrifice, and none of those kids will know your name. We do it in secret. We do it without a parade or without fanfare. None of those children that receive those gifts that you've sacrificed and you went shopping for, you got the gifts for, you did, none of those kids will know your name. Because we don't serve in order to be recognized and we don't serve in order because they deserve it, but we serve and we give our life away because it reflects the heart of God that we see descending out of the divine and enfleshing himself in this vulnerable little baby. So what do we do? We follow in the way of Christ. And we learn that life's purpose and meaning will never be found where we are the center and we're the most, notori we're the most uh, notor notorious or have the most notoriety in of our life and, and centered around us. But we learn to follow the way of Christ, that we come with all of our raw, authentic selves, unedited selves, and we learn to follow the way of the humble servant, King Jesus. I hope that this inspires you to have greater awe and worship of the God of the universe and the depths to which he was willing to go for you and for me and the life that he leads us towards that is abundant and eternal both now and forever. Let's pray together before we continue. 
Jesus, I am humbled by you, by your great steps of descending to us. May that rattle around in our hearts this week. And may we be changed as a result of it. May we respond to those around us, not out of arrogance or pride or needing to be served, but may we find places to serve, to follow in your ways, and that we would find it to be abundant, life-giving, and eternal. It's in your name we pray.